I'm Cheryl Hunter. Hey. I am an author, as they said, and a speaker. And one of the things that I speak to people mostly about is how to deal when difficult things happen in life. So let me just do a little temperature check. Have you, how many of you have ever had difficult things happen in life? Like things that you wish had not happened. Bad stuff that happens to good people, namely you. <laughs> it, th there's no getting around that. It happens to all of us, right? At so I don't want to be the voice of doom, but bad stuff is going to happen, and it does. Now what? You know, how do you live a powerful life in the face of that? Well, that's what today is about. So there are a couple things that are going to have today be valuable. I don't want to do anything unless it's valuable and ideally fun and makes a lasting difference. You guys with me? So here's what's going to have today be fun, valuable, and make a lasting difference. Anybody want to take a stab at what that is, actually? Well, I'll give you a clue. It has nothing to do with me and what I say and do up here. Now, what? That may seem completely counterintuitive, but it actually has nothing to do with me, and it has everything to do with you. And specifically what it has to do with, with you, is the way that you listen. Now, you might think, now what? I'm listening. What are you talking about? But I say that there's a fundamental flaw in the way that we look at listening. We usually perceive listening as somebody says something and we listen, end of story, right? Like it's pretty simple, right? Somebody says something, I'm up here talking, you're listening and that's all there is, right? Well, I say that's false and what's really going on is I'm saying something and you're listening and then you're listening to a running commentary in your head, like a little voice, that comments about everything that gets said. It's not just when I'm talking, it happens all the time. You guys know those two grumpy old guys on the Muppets? That sit there and go rah, 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 rah about everything? It's kind of like that. So I'm going to just stop talking for a minute and give you a chance to just listen to that little voice that's in the background commenting all the time. Okay, I'll be quiet. <laughs> Do you hear it there? It might say things like, well, what does she mean voice? Poor woman has a voice or something like this. But if you notice it and bring your attention to it, you'll find that it's always there. The thing is, what it does is it detracts from everything. It splits its time between negatively commenting on everybody else in the world and negatively commenting on you and tearing you down. Its job is basically nothing more than that. I said it makes no difference, but it actually makes a negative difference. So here's what's going to have today be valuable. I ask you to just catch it. Catch it as it's in action and set it aside. You can pick it back up when you leave if you'd like, but in order to have today be valuable, catch that little voice clamoring to comment and just thank you for sharing and put it aside. So that's the first thing that's going to have today be valuable and fun and make a difference. The second thing is that you have to participate. So whenever I ask you to participate and say something or jump in or share in a particular way, do whatever, it's going to take you participating. So are you willing to listen like that and participate? Okay, woo, cool, thank you. Now, here's where I'm gonna ask you to start participating, okay? In a moment, I'm gonna ask you a series of questions. And when I do, I'm gonna, or rather, when I do ask you certain questions and they apply to you, I'm gonna ask you to stand up. Now, don't get worried, like I'm not gonna, you're not gonna be seen doing this because I'm gonna ask you all to close your eyes first so that no one will see you responding to particular questions. So in a moment, hold on, stay with me, not yet, okay? Stay with me, come back to the conversation. So in a moment, I'm gonna ask you some questions with your eyes closed, and then you stand up when I say something that responds to you or correlates with you, that's true for you, and then keep standing, okay? 
So please close your eyes, and please keep them closed until I tell you otherwise, okay? Everybody close your eyes, please. Okay, with your eyes closed. Have you ever felt discriminated against? Have you ever been left out because of? Have you ever been physically abused or hurt? Or have you ever made, been made fun of because of the way you look? Because of the way you act? Keep your eyes closed, please. Because of the color of your skin or your hair or anything else physical about you? Your weight, your height, your size? OK, stop talking. Just hang out for a second. Keep standing. Have you ever been made fun of because of your friends or your family or your culture? Keep standing. Have you ever been made fun of or discriminated against because of things you just can't figure out? Like you don't know why people are judging you, but they just are. OK, please open your eyes and take a look around. Thank you, thank you. Now hold on, stay standing, okay? Stay standing, stay standing. Okay, come back to me for a second, but stay standing. In a minute, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna recite some more questions, okay? And when I do, and something lands for you, I'm gonna ask you to take a seat. And if you're still sitting, please stand up so that you can participate in this part, thank you. If you've ever discriminated against somebody, if you've ever judged somebody, said something mean about somebody, if you've ever taken any action against somebody because of the way they look, the way they act, the way they behave, because of their culture, ethnicity, color of their skin, their religion, their beliefs, because they do things that you don't like, because they have behaviors that drive you nuts, because, well, you just don't understand why, but you just don't like them. Okay, everybody, open your eyes, take a look around, please. Thank you. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> Thank you. So, what's the point of that exercise? Here's the point I'm going to tell you. The point of that exercise is to realize that bullying is not somebody else's problem. It's not something that happens out there. It's Bullying Awareness Month. And a lot of times I think that we think of bullying as a particular kind of behavior that, you know, happens to other people or sometimes us or something. But the reason I wanted to do that exercise is to really bring home that this is not somebody else's problem. We're talking about us on both ends, receiving and giving, if you will. So here's what about that will make a difference to realize. One, ouch, like the truth hurts. And two, we can do something about it. Mahatma Gandhi said that we can be the change we wish to see in the world. And he, you know, Gandhi was responding to what could certainly be seen as bullying. The British stepped into India, took over, took control, and said, hey, this is, this is an extension of Great Britain now. And Gandhi said, no. He said the British shall leave India and do so without force. And he did that by maintaining that we could each be the change that we wish to see in the world. So my whole point in being here today is to empower you to be that, to be the change. So how do you do that? I mean, it's, it's easy to bully somebody that you don't know something about. It's easy to make fun of people when you don't know them at all. You know nothing about them and the way that they live and think and act and what makes them tick. But it's another matter altogether to 
make fun of somebody or bully somebody or give them a hard time when you know them. More importantly, when you know them to be a person just like you are, with the same kind of wishes and fears and hopes and dreams for their life. So, you know, they say you can learn something the easy way or you can learn something the hard way. And one of the ways that we can learn things in an easy manner is if somebody gives us their lessons, like if they teach us what they went through, kind of shortcuts our path. And you, know, you can learn things the hard way by getting knocked around in the head by life and reinventing the wheel and going about things, just trying to figure it all out on your own. And my point in being here is to tell you my story in hopes that it will shortcut your journey and you can learn in the easy way. There are things that unify us as human beings. And one of the things that most unifies us is, like I said earlier, those, those situations that we wish hadn't happened when bad things happen. I think one of the reasons why that unites us sometimes more than anything does when difficult circumstances happen is because we can all relate. I mean, at some time, in some way, every one of us will have things happen that we wish hadn't. We showed that earlier by show of hands. I'm no exception. When I was a kid, these guys said that I'm from Colorado, and I, and I, I loved it there. I grew up in a, in a, on a horse ranch in the middle of the Rockies, way up high, super, super remote, but I had to get out. We were so far removed that in every single direction, every single direction but one, miles off in the distance, there was no sign of civilization whatsoever. The one exception was at nighttime, if I pressed my head up against the window in my bedroom, I could see way off in the distance lights every so often that were on the freeway going from Pueblo to Walsenburg. And I was so jealous of those people because they were going places. I mean, mind you, they were only going to Walsenburg, Colorado, but it was better than where I was going, which was nowhere, absolutely nowhere. So I, I, I played hooky one day from school, whoops, and um, I tried to concoct a game plan to get me out of Rye, Colorado. I hopped on my mini bike and rode the hour and 15 minutes round trip to Colorado City, which was the closest town that had a store. And I picked up a Glamour magazine, a Baby Ruth, and a root beer, and rode back home, and opened up the magazine, like bound and determined I was going to figure a way to get to the big city. And I was reading the magazine, I was thinking, huh, oh, no way, and it hit me. There it was, the, the life plan right there, right before my eyes. I could be a model. I mean, I was tall enough, I was already on the boys' basketball team. There you go. I thought, geez, this is the perfect plan. I mean. I'd have to move to a city to do that. Nobody would argue. There certainly aren't any models in Rye, Colorado. So there it was. My plan was set. I just had to get someplace where they needed models. So I chose Europe and talked my best friend Lizzie into going with me. And we both got a couple jobs and said, that's it. Let's go. We'll take off. And the big day finally arrived. We got on the plane, flew to France. And no kidding, no sooner did we get there then this dude with a really nice camera around his neck walks up to me and goes, are you a model? I mean, what? It, 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 I just stood there and hesitated, and he s said, well, I can make you one. You just need to go come with me and my friend over there. He had a tall friend standing off in the distance. I mean, that is how easy it is to become a model in France. Someone just walks up to you right when you get there. At my friend Lizzie that I went with is like, no, absolutely not, no way. But like, she didn't know anything about my game plan to get out of Rye, and I mean, I just, that, forget it. So I just ditched her, and I went off with the guy and his friend, and you know, they seemed okay. He had a cool camera. They drugged me and took me to an abandoned construction site and beat me mercilessly. I had no idea. I had made a sound when it was kicked. They drugged me again, 
and they've raped me repeatedly and cut me. And I had one option available to me, which was to just look away. I turned my head as far as I could to the right, and I just stared at the wall, and there was this, this dancing speck of light on the wall that I just stared at with all of my might. I didn't know what it was, but it was a reflection from something outside, and it was free, whatever it was. And I just kept staring at it, and the more I stared at it, the more I felt I became that dancing spark of, spark of light. I wasn't this scrap heap of a girl being torn to shreds. I was just a little shimmering speck of light that could fly away any moment I chose. They dumped me in a park in Nice three days later. At that point, the why questions started really pouring in my head. Why did I even have to go with them? Why am I so stupid and gullible? Why am I not content just to stay at home like everybody else? Why would God let that happen to me? Is there such a thing of it as God anyway? I didn't tell anybody. I couldn't tell anybody. Because if I told anybody, they would know that I was now dirty and disgusting and filthy and ruined. They would know how stupid I was. And so I just, you know, did the thing that most of us do when something bad happens. I just shoved it down. Pretended it never happened. You know, got back to life as usual. Um, obviously, I became very removed from people. I became very aloof. It's kind of like the only way I could cope. Just very on the surface, like, just cool, you know, how are you, good, fine, yeah. I did become a model. It uh, suited me really well. Never in all the years I was a model did anyone ever ask me to have a deep conversation. I had found my people. Uh, the modeling industry is this kind of weird one where, you know that theory, the grass is always greener someplace else? It's alive and real in that world. The, uh, wherever I would go, before very long, they'd send me someplace else. Because wherever we were not was looked at as infinitely cooler as whatever city we were in. So if I was in Paris, they sent me to Milan. Milan sent me to London. London sent me to Japan. It was in Japan that the next stage of my journey evolved. When I was not actually working, on set, I would hang out the whole time in my agency, sit in the office and read. Nobody was ever there. There was a completely unused conference room where n n literally nobody was ever there except the grandmother of m the woman who owned my agency. They've got this interesting tradition in Japan, which is they include their elders in like everything, their business and personal lives, because they are seen to have a lot of wisdom and they bestow that wisdom in their lives, which is kind of like a really cool concept. But so I'm sitting there one day in the conference room, pretending like fake reading, just really plotting my revenge against the guys from France. And I'm, I'm absentmindedly running my hands over this conference table that they had. They had this big, massive wooden conference table. It was like 10 feet long, beautiful carved out of one solid piece of wood. It was, it was beautiful, but it had like all these divots and dents and nicks, and, and it was it kind of narrow at one end, like the tree must have narrowed at the end. And I was just sitting there, like, like I said, like fake reading, absentmindedly running my hand over one of the dents in the wood, and the grandmother walks in and she goes, ah, wabi-sabi. And she shocked me out of my stupor. I looked up and said, now, wait, what? Wabi-sabi? Oh, is that like wasabi? Because I totally love sushi. And from the other room, Miyoko, my agent, cups her hand over the phone and laughs, no, no. I look back at the grandmother and I go, oh, um, wabi-sabi, oh, is that like wood? Wabi-sabi, wood? And Miyoko again from the other room goes, no, 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 hon. 
Wabi-sabi is the Japanese aesthetic. Oh, I said, like having no idea what she was talking about. Okay. But within just a moment, Miyoko hangs up the phone. She and her grandfather cruise into the conference room, and the grandmother and the grandfather, Miyoko, take turns telling me what wabi-sabi means. The grandfather says that wabi-sabi is the most important of all Japanese principles. He says that wabi-sabi states that the beauty of an object, any object, lies in the imperfections of that object. He says things like damages and mistakes and ruined parts, those are actually designed in and sought after. The grandmother said that beauty is a study in contrast. So something can only be seen as beautiful if it also embodies imperfection to the same degree. These people were blowing my mind. I had to get my junk and get out of there so I could go walk around and just think. I started walking around in the streets and I was thinking, oh, now wait, does this, uh, does this mean wabi-sabi could even apply to me? No, that's impossible. That is totally impossible. That is totally impossible. I am damaged and ruined and this is all just bleh. I just kept walking and kept walking and kept walking and was starving finally. I stopped in a little outdoor cafe, super busy, one for lunch, grabbed my lunch at the counter, came and plopped down at a table. And I was sitting there, nose buried in a book, being aloof as usual when I hear shouting, Naze! Senso Nihon! I hear. And I look up, and there's this Japanese, very disheveled woman with lots of bags sitting kind of opposite me. And she's like staring at me <laughs> and shouting. And I look around, and I'm sure I'm mistaken, but no, damn, she's staring straight at me. And people are starting to look. And this guy at the table next to me leans in and says, she asks why why you make war on Japan. <laughs> now what? Why do I make war on Japan? Like I'm a teenager. I don't make war on Japan. What war? Like Pearl Harbor, World War II kind of thing? What do I look like, some 60-year-old dude in an army uniform? What do I look like, the president? I don't make war on Japan. I put my nose back in my book. Crazy old bag lady, make war on Japan. So sit here and eat my Japanese food, crazy old. And then I'm just ignoring that it's happening, trying to, when there it goes again. Naze! Senso Nihon! Senso Nihon! Even louder. I mean, there is no ignoring it this time. I look up and everyone is now staring at us. And I put my nose back in the book. But there is definitely no ignoring her now because now she starts to take stuff out of her bags. And she pulls out this little cloth envelope and unfolds it. And it's got two little tattered black and white photographs that have turned yellow with age. One is a man and the other is a woman. And she picks them both up and holds them over her head and starts shouting again. I mean, there is truly no ignoring her now. Every eye in the restaurant is on her, the woman with the photos over her head, and me, the one and only Westerner. The man at the table next to me leans in again and says, she asked why. Why you kill her parents? Kill her parents? Now that is just enough, kill her parents. Who does this woman think I am? I don't kill her parents, make war on Japan. This woman is nuts start throwing my stuff together, hoping that people will know. I am definitely, not, I do not know this crazy woman. I am throwing my stuff together. I'm looking at her. Look at her. She's, she's nuts. Just look at her. She could just snot running down her face and snot bubbling over her mouth as she cries and screams. And look at that crazy face. Look at those crazy eyes. And as I looked at her eyes, I got drawn deep within them and I saw this anguish and frustration and this sadness and this inability to express any of it. And as I looked deeper, I saw her, this deep, dark pit of despair. And I no longer saw a crazy woman. I saw me. 
I bowed to the woman. She stopped crying and screaming. She became silent. I raised my head and said the only two words that made any sense. Wabi sabi. Everyone was still silent and staring at us and I rever reverently gathered all of my belongings, put them in my bag and stood. I bowed to them all. Without exception, everyone, young and old alike, bowed back. I used to pray that Wabi Sabi was real and that somehow, some way, it could apply to me. For a while I thought, oh, I will just go live in Japan for the rest of my life to be anything other than damage. Now I know differently. If there's one thing I know for certain, Wabi Sabi is real. You are magnificent. And what makes you magnificent is everything you've previously believed is wrong with you. I leave you with my deepest wish that you know your beauty, that you own your magnificence, that you claim your wabi-sabi. Thank you. I shared a similar story to that when I did a TEDx talk. I, I don't know if you know TED Talks or TEDx Talks. There are these cool talks that people do around the world and they put them on video and they have a Creative Commons license, which means that they can be shared online for free without reservation worldwide. So, so the good thing about that is millions of people see these messages all across the world. And ever since my uh, TEDx video went up online, I've been contacted by hundreds of people who, I, like that I, people that I don't know, who've contacted me and said, just reached out to me and told me their stories. I've heard from people who were raped or sexually abused. I've heard from people who were even abducted. I even heard from somebody who met that same Japanese bag lady at lunch one day. Just kidding. Um, but in all seriousness, I, I've, there's something about when these people shared their stories with me. When we share our stories, we get liberated. And when people share their stories with us, it has that same kind of ability that just set us free. You know those things that we hold inside and never tell anybody? They trap us, but when we share them, they set us free. So I want to give, I'm going to create an interesting opportunity now for you guys to share your stories. Give me a second. I just want to check the time, okay? Now, we're going to do this in a totally unique, fun, safe way that's unlike anything you've ever done before, okay? So in a moment, not yet, but in a moment, I'm going to ask you to pair up into groups of two or three. Not yet, but in a moment, because I'm going to tell you a couple things about that. When you do pair up with somebody, hold on, come back to the conversation, okay, guys? I'm going to ask that you pair up with somebody that you don't know particularly well. Ideally, somebody you did not come with today. Hold on, come on back. Come back. Probably the best way to do that would be to choose somebody in, in front of you or behind you. And if you find that there's somebody that's left out, like you found you're a pair and there's somebody like a third, ask them to join your group. Don't wait like for them to have to ask you, hey guys, can I, can I go with you? Just ask them to join. Don't be in groups of more than three, just twos or threes, okay? So not yet, hold on, just, I'm gonna give you a few more things, okay? When you get into your groups, not yet, but when you do, I'm going to ask you to share a particular sentence and then fill in the end of the sentence. And what I'm going to ask you to share is this sentence. 
If you really knew me, you'd know blank. If you really knew me, you'd know blank, okay? And then fill that in. Now, you can, you guys hang out. Hey, you guys, just stay with me here, okay? You can, you can answer that question in one of two ways. You could either be authentic or you can be stingy. It is your call. If you were authentic, it could, it would, it, it'll make a difference for you, like a lasting difference. And if you're stingy, well, it will make no difference. An example of being authentic is you might share something like, if you really knew me, you'd know my parents are fighting a lot. I don't know what's going to happen. It's kind of freaking me the heck out. If you were being stingy, you could say something like, if you really knew me, you'd know that I totally want to hook up with so-and-so because they're totally a hottie. <laughs> like, it would make no difference whatsoever, you know? In other words, I request that you be authentic. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to split up into groups of two or three, and then I'm going to give you some more instructions. So just keep your ear here, OK? OK, please get a group. Please get a group of two or three. Okay, Is, are there any groups that have three in them? Just raise your hand if you have three. Okay, cool, thank you. Now we're gonna choose an A. You need, uh, okay, got it. We're gonna choose an A and a B and a C, okay? And this go around, you're gonna choose A's will have the shortest hair. B is the next shortest hair, C is the longest hair, okay? <laughs> Stay with me. <laughs> Hold on. <clears throat> A's, A's, you're going to go first. Now, hold on, guys. One more critical bit of instruction, okay? One more critical bit of instruction. When you are the listener, and everyone will have a chance to be the speaker and the listener, when you're the listener, I would like you to listen this way. Remember earlier when I said to put aside the, the condemning, criticizing voice? One, you want to do that. But two, you want to be your most gracious and generous listener that you could ever be. Like, imagine how you'd want someone to listen to you if you were telling your, like revealing your truth, your heart. Listen to them that way. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to say anything. Just be there. Be there for them. Have their back and listen. So I will let you know when it's time to switch, OK? So A's, you're going to start, and B's, or B's and C's, you will listen. And the sentence again is, if you really know me, knew me, you'd know blank. OK, please begin. I'll switch you when it's time. Please stop and switch. Please stop and switch. Bees go next. Switch. Bees, please begin. Please stop and switch so C's can go. Please stop and switch so C's can go. Please begin, C's. Please begin to wrap it up. Okay, please give a round of applause to your awesome partners. <laughs> Thank you. I invite you to listen generously like that to people from now on. So how many of you can see that it would make a difference for your parents to be here for this talk, or a talk like this. So I'm, here's why I'm asking. Tonight, we've put together over at the pavilion, right? At the pavilion, I'm going to give a talk like this, but uh, a little more extended version. You guys are totally welcome to come back. But you're also welcome to send your parents as well. And I'm going to train them in a particular way of listening, how to listen to you extra generously. If that would make a difference for you, send your parents. Um, I'd love to stay in touch with you guys. 
I put my website here. It's CherylHunter.com. You can go on there and uh, either sign up for my list and I send out valuable videos and trainings every week that are designed to make a difference in your life or add me on Facebook or Twitter or whatever you like there. And I also on CherylHunter.com forward slash OPHS CherylHunter.com forward slash OPHS. I uh, gave you guys, I put some videos on there, especially for you, that, are, that deepen the stuff that we talked about today. It has been awesome to be here with you. Thank you for sharing your week with me. Thank you. So inspired by you. Thank you. Go crush it in life. Yay! Thank you.